Welcome to Healthy Pets, Healthy Odors. I'm Dr. Edmund Swakowski. You know, I invited uh, Morgan Matthews and Tori Billings on to be on the show today, and they're actually gonna, gonna be the host of the show today. <laughs> and we're gonna be talking uh, about a very uh, different, different topics today. You know, we're gonna talk about dogs and pets and, and thyroid and, and, and so forth. You know, I, I just met Morgan and although I've seen her here <laughs> doing the shows for, uh, uh, for this past year. But Tori, I kind of known, uh, Tori and I used to live across the street from each other. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, when I took off and moved to Arizona, uh, we stopped being neighbors. But do, do you both have, have pets? Yeah, actually I do. I have a six-year-old poodle. Her name's Hannah. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, you've had her for, for all that time? Is, got her as a puppy? Yeah, we did. Yeah. And what about you, Tori? I have a ten-year-old Maltese named Snow. <laughs> Snow, so ten years. So you, well, you have had, you would have had Snow when I left then. Yes. Yeah. She was really, really little. Yeah. Right. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. So. Yep. So well, let, let's turn the let's turn the show over to to Morgan and Tori. So the first thing I think we'd like to ask you is how do you feel about electric fences? Yeah, I'm not real fond of those. Really. Um, and I'll and I'll tell you why. First of all. I don't think it's the best idea to to uh, shock a dog right. to train it, <laughs> all right, number one. But you know what happens is people rely on those fences, and if those fences are, are on and the dog's been trained properly to avoid the shock, but what happens when those fences aren't, are malfunctioning and the electricity is off or the battery for the collar isn't charged properly, that fence will not stop that dog from, from leaving. And then another thing is, those the dogs, if they're prompted enough, something entices them enough to leave the yard, they may take that shock to leave the yard, but they won't go back in the yard and mm -hmm. experience that shock again. Mm -hmm. So you know, when I when I lived in the neighborhood, Tori, and I would take a few recall all those dogs I had, those yeah. six dogs, mm -hmm. six little dachshunds, and I'd take them out for walks. I, I stopped walking them. And the reason was people had electric fences that were always malfunctioning and their dogs would run out and try to entangle with my dogs. Oh. And I literally had to stop walking my dogs because of that. Because I didn't want to carry a stick to beat off the dog that was <laughs> attempting to, to attack my dog, right. you know. And it was everybody that had electric fences that, were, that weren't being tentative to their, attentive to their functioning. You know, they just thought the dog was going to stay with inside its boundaries. Right. You know, and then one of the big things too is those electric fences don't prevent another animal from coming in mm -hmm. to your yard. So you have a dog, and and you know we have coyotes here, and they can get in the be attacked by a coyote, especially a small dog. You know, so so to answer your question, I am not fond of electric fences for those reasons. Are there any like major health risks that can happen whenever you do have an electric fence that could affect your pet? Well, you know, there's a lot of th theories, Morgan, on electrical energy and what it does to us on a cellular level. Um, I don't know if you uh, are aware of our cell phones and, and the magnetic field that they put out. Um, we actually did a show on that. We had mm -hmm. a, a physician mm -hmm. on talking about that. So. Uh, there are no studies, but I, I think that you can infer that there's some damage that happens by wearing some kind of electrical device on, you know, okay. on your pet. You yeah. Know. Do you think um, electric fences are becoming more popular? Do you think they're kind of going away? Or do you think well, that just depends on the pet? I, I, I think they're as popular as they've been. Uh, in fact, you know, people just moved into a house across the street from me, and the first thing they did is put in an electric fence. And um, I, I think they think it's a safe and secure position for their animal, uh, and I just don't feel that's the case. Now, that's my personal opinion, right. you know. Um, do you have an electric fence at your place? No, no. I don't. Yeah. We don't take my dog outside because she's so little. She's so, so little. So we're like, yeah. yeah, so she's pad trained, so she stays inside all the time. And, and you have to worry about hawks and you have yeah. to worry, you know. Because she's white, she's like really bright. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want anything to come and like get her. Yeah, exactly. You really have to be concerned about that. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. I know when I lived in Arizona, we had everything from bobcats to mountain lions. The coyotes were plentiful, hawks. Mm -hmm. and, and I was paranoid with 
you know, my little dogs, I moved out there with four of them. Yeah. And uh, they were beside my feet all the time, never, mm -hmm. never out on their own. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so switching the topic to thyroids, because I know you mentioned that earlier. What is a thyroid? Ah, that's my, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> Th thyroid is, is actually probably one of the most important organs. It's an organ located right here in your throat. It looks like kind of like a butterfly. And um, it it's like, sits on top of your voice box. And it actually produces a hormone. And the hormone is so powerful that it controls every organ and every cell in your body, including your brain, your heart, your liver, your kidney. And when that thyroid isn't working right, you develop illness and problems. So I, I think it's actually so um, misunderstood mm -hmm. and underdiagnosed. And we do a lot of things that help damage that thyroid in our lifetime. What kind of disease or like health uh, risks can happen from a thyroid not working right? Well, I think I, you can have heart disease because it regulates the electrical component. Mm -hmm. The thyroid is our voltage regulator. And, and if, you don't, if you know anything about a car, we have a battery and an engine, yeah. you know, but we have something you know, every car has called a voltage regulator. And it makes the voltage in the proper amounts so that your car runs properly. So you could have a brand new car with a brand new battery, but a defective voltage regulator and mm -hmm. your car just dies, it won't run. And that same thing happens within the body. And it happens with each of our cells because our cells have electrical potential in them. And they, the DNA and the, and the regeneration of our cells, which regenerates our organs and everything, mm -hmm. uh, all works on a particular voltage, particular to that organ, to that cell. Mm -hmm. And if that voltage regulator, our thyroid isn't working, that cell can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so you hear of things like autoimmune diseases. Yeah. And that's a word that I think the medical profession loves to throw out, you know. Um, and there's no, no explanation why we have autoimmune diseases. For example, uh, diabetes is an autoimmune disease. Arthritis is an autoimmune disease. Uh, psoriasis, autoimmune. autoimmune. Uh, my personal opinion and, and my study has shown me that we can look back to a dysfunctioning, low-functioning, non-functioning thyroid, mm -hmm. you know. It, 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 the thyroid produces so little hormone in a whole year, it only produces about a teaspoon of that hormone oh, wow. in a whole year. Cool. So it's such a powerful hormone and it, it gets affected by a lot of things that we do in our lifestyles. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how are ways that we like, are able to like, damage it or like, how is it? Well, Morgan, one of the, <laughs> w one of the most interesting ways that's damaging it and, and we don't think about it and, and we're in my opinion, again, we're being lied to. We drink and we bathe in, in water, right? We turn on our faucet, we drink that water, we cook with that water. In that water is chlorine and, and fluoride or fluorine. Mm -hmm. And you say, what's the big deal? I mean, your dentist tells you you need fluoride to, to make your teeth strong and so forth and prevent cavities. And uh, there's evidence that fluoride even strengthens bones a little bit. But that's a natural fluoride. In our water, it's not natural fluoride. So what happens is that we have something that's, that's in our food, in some foods, called iodine. Mm -hmm. And that thyroid makes a hormone that's made of two components, an amino acid called tyrosine and iodine. But what happens is there's a family of what we call halides, which is chlorine, fluorine, bromine, and iodine. Well, those first three that I mentioned, fluorine, fluoride, chlorine, bromine, bromine, you know, they're all derivatives mm -hmm. of, one of one of another. They're smaller particles, and so they can get in to the receptor sites on that thyroid, dislodge the, I dislodge the iodine, so we lose iodine, and now we have chlorine, fluoride, and bromide in there and then we have a hormone that our body doesn't recognize. Because right. that hormone is tyrosine and iodine. Mm. Okay. So just drinking tap water causes a, fluoride, uh, causes a thyroid problem. That's o crazy. Over time, yeah. And then all in all, our, our baking goods, on all, uh, everything that we eat that's made from flour, the government in the 50s 
mandated that all iodine has to be taken out of flour and substituted bromine in there for no known medical reason. We don't mm -hmm. need bromine in any, in any way whatsoever. So I don't know why that was done. I mean, there's no logical reason for it, but that's what's happened. So, so you know, we're being inundated with these halides that cause the iodine to leave. Mm -hmm. And then we have a hormone that's not functioning. We still have that hormone. If they, we do a blood test, mm -hmm. that hormone will show up, but it's not, they're not being tested properly to know exactly whether we have iodine in that hormone or not. Right. Oh, you know? okay. So then we start developing problems because basically all of our electrical potential goes off and our cells can't regenerate properly or function properly. Right. It's like bringing me back to chemistry with all those elements. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, um, like not drinking tap water as much and stuff, but how can we fix thyroid issues like that? Well, it, th thyroid can be fixed uh, with some effort. It's not an easy fix because you have to really understand what's going on before you can fix something. Mm -hmm. And you have to look, so you have to, the first thing you have to do is you have to find a physician that really understands thyroid yeah. function and thyroid treatment. And I, I don't say that lightly because your average physician does not. And we have specialists that do that called endocrinologists. And sometimes they're not aware of exactly what's going on. And, and I, I don't say that lightly. It, uh, you, you would think that we'd go to these professionals and they would truly understand. But the educational process has taught us to look for three things. And these are tests that are dictated by drug manufacturers, basically. And we end up having um, decisions based on really faulty testing. So y you, have to, you have to do a number of things. You have to have a proper blood tests, which are about, I would say, on average, about six different blood tests that aren't normally done to tell you where your thyroid is. And then you would have to do a few blood tests to tell you what might be lacking, because sometimes our thyroids are, aren't working because we're lacking some minerals like selenium, zinc, um, magnesium, manganese, vitamin C. We, we can be lacking those things. It causes our thyroid hormone not to function properly. So you have to do those types of testings. Then you have to look at the, one of the biggest things, and that's symptoms, because there's a ton of symptoms mm -hmm. that can happen when your thyroid isn't functioning properly. I know we're going to take a break here in a minute, so maybe when we come back from the break, we'll talk about some of those symptoms. And, and then we can s kind of see how we can fix that, you know. But it's a very involved process. And uh, the best thing to do is, is to look at those symptoms and mm -hmm. do the proper diagnosing. And then you can get, s get a fix to it. You know, on average, it used to be just old people got thyroid problems. <laughs> but now we're seeing teenagers with thyroid problems. Mm -hmm. Is this all relevant in dogs, too? It, it's absolutely the same way in, in, in dogs. It's actually a little easier to test in dogs because they seem to do a, have a thyroid crash more. They show uh, up a little quicker and, you know, and a little easier uh, with dogs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, thyroid, every animal has a thyroid, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So... Well, I think we're going to take a break here. We'll be back here in Healthy Pets, Healthy Unos with, with uh, Morgan and Tori. Welcome back to Healthy Pets, Healthy Owners. I'm Dr. Edwin Sokowski, and we're here with Morgan and, and Tori, and we're talking thyroid. <laughs> okay, so back to the whole symptoms and stuff of thyroids. What are some of the symptoms in humans as well as in dogs? Well, I gotta tell you, the signs and symptoms, Morgan, are probably the, the most important diagnostic tools that you can have. They're, they're often the most ignored. So one of those things that, that you could look at is those autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. Diabetes, uh, heart condition, arthritis. Uh, I, I would even go to, you know, you can add to those things like, like psoriasis, for example. A lot of people have skin problems. Mm -hmm. uh, even acne can be related mm -hmm. to low thyroid problem, especially adult acne. Um, being able 
to not lose weight when you're dying. You know, a lot of people go on diets and they can't lose weight or they'll, they'll lose a few pounds and then they're done. Um, the inability to lose weight when you're, when you're trying to do so is a sign that your thyroid isn't working properly. The inability to, um, or the fact that you're gaining weight and you know, a lot of people aren't eating and they'll say, I'm not eating much and I'm gaining weight, that, that's a sign your thyroid isn't working properly. Uh, hair falling out. Um, a lot of people lose this part of their eyelash. That's a sign that the thyroid's not working. Thyroid growing larger is a sign that there's the dysfunction. Uh, skin problems, as I mentioned, uh, getting sick all the time. What's oddly and not really understood is the thyroid is one of the biggest components of your immune system. So somebody who's constantly having a cold or they, they, they get a cold or they get the flu and then they recover and then they're sick again, that's a sign. Uh, snoring, not sleeping well at night, having anxiety, you know, um, mood changes. These are all things that you could have one of or, or multiple signs and symptoms. You know, it's something that you should then be looking at proper diagnosis of your thyroid. You know, one of the things that's, that people often don't realize is when you're constantly cold or you're sensitive to temperature, your hands are cold all the time, your feet are cold all the time, those are signs that thyroid, your thyroid could not be working properly. That's really interesting because I feel like those are things that we just kind of like say or like notice about ourselves and we're not like thinking about the like actual cause or like the deeper issue behind it. Yeah. Like my one dance teacher always has cold hands and cold feet and I'm always like, oh, you're so cold, don't touch me. But like I never actually thought it would be it could be linked to something that's that serious. And it's individual for, for, for different people. Yeah. Some people can be intolerant to heat. Really? And just the opposite. Mm -hmm. And you can actually be extremely skinny and have a thyroid problem. It, it, it just depends on where you are and uh, you, you as an individual, how the thyroid interacts with you. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is you have to take all of these signs and symptoms, and again, to me, that's one of the biggest things to look at. You need to listen and, and, and see what a patient is saying. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm doing this, I feel this way, you know. I, um, I, you know, sleeping is a big one, and, and that's when you repair. Yeah. So when you're not sleeping right, you could, that's one of the signs of, of this thyroid problem. Right. So you look at the big picture, and then you do blood diagnostic tools, the proper ones, to help refine where you are. Mm -hmm. The, these all sound like really common things. Do you think this is like easily like brushed off by doctors? Is that why it's like it, it absolutely mostly is. underdiagnosed? It absolutely is, Morgan. The, the, the typical blood test that any physician will do, it, it's called a thyroid panel, and it's a TS, TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, mm -hmm. a T4, which is your thyroid makes about 80% T4, but it's a hormone that your body can't use. It's called a resting hormone. And your body has to take that T4 and convert it to T3, and then convert it to bioavailable T3 in order for your body to use it. But we, we only test medically this, this T, TSH, and we test the T4. And we make the assumption that if we have enough T4, then we have enough T3. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case. Because you, if you don't have the proper components to convert that T4 into T3, and then into bioavailable bio T3, then you don't have thyroid hormone. And, and another component that is not looked at is a non-functioning liver because 80% of that hormone gets converted from T4 into T3 in the, in the liver. So if you have fatty liver disease or you have some type of cirrhosis of the liver, then you're not converting that hormone. Right. So that poses a problem and it's, no one's really looking at that. You know, I preach it all the time, <laughs> but um, the average person seeing the average physician is not having that, those problems addressed. Right. Because you can, you can fix, sometimes, sometimes the thyroid isn't functioning because you're not eating enough protein, proper proteins, because it's that amino acid tyrosine comes from eating animal products. And so people that are vegans and vegetarians, I mean, there's a little bit of tyrosine in, in in, in vegetables and so forth, and, but not in the proper amounts. Mm -hmm. So if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, you're not, you're not um, having enough of that amino acid to make that hormone. If you, uh, you need something called glutathione, which is made in the liver. And it, again, it's, 
comes mostly from animal products. So mm -hmm. uh, some of the sickest people I see are vegans and vegetarians. Now, if you're a vegan, um, you're, you're probably really sick. You know, vegetarians uh, tend to eat a little bit of eggs or cheese and things like that. So you can get some of those components right. in there, you know. But it really, what we take in uh, helps our body make what it's supposed to make. Mm -hmm. You know? Right. So you can, you can sometimes, I always recommend besides a blood test that somebody gets an ultrasound of their thyroid because you can see whether there's a disease process going on. Mm -hmm. And if there are certain things that are occurring in the thyroid, you, you need to treat it a little bit differently. Right. But you, some people are just lacking things like selenium, zinc, glutathione, vitamin C, uh, um, uh, magnesium, manganese. These are all things that that the thyroid needs to to work to make that hormone. So sometimes all you need to do is take supplements to to put those ingredients back into your those nutrients into your system to make your thyroid work. You know, oh, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have a disease process and you need to be on some type of medication. But in there lies a problem because the the thyroid um, medications are usually synthetic T4, and again they make the assumption well we're having T4, so we ha we're making T3, but mm -hmm. that's that's still not the case. You right. know, I, I like desiccated or natural thyroid. But I got to tell you, one of the most interesting things, you're kind of designed to work and work properly. Our thyroids are placed on top of our voice box, mm -hmm. and every time that we talk, and every time that we sing, we actually stimulate our thyroid to, to send that hormone out. Really cool. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's yeah. really interesting. You, you look how intricate we are, yeah. and, and how one of you know we in medicine we 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 become isolated. You know, we go to a dentist for our mouth, we go to a heart f doctor for our heart, a foot doctor right. for our feet, but nobody's looking at how we all work. Right. And every component of our body depends on another component, and mm -hmm. it's designed that way. Yeah. If your intestinal tract is messed up, your thyroid can't work. They depend on one another. If your thyroid's messed up, your your intestinal tract can't work. Right. Did, you ever, did you guys ever hear this, the statement, our immune system, 80, uh, 70 percent of it's based in our, our intestinal tract? I have not. I have yeah. no idea. <laughs> that's, that's actually something that the medical profession touts. They, they, they talk about that, and that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. But if our intestinal tract is not working, our thyroid can't work. And if our thyroid right. is not working, our intestinal can't work, tract can't work. Then if our liver is not working, none of it works. Right. Yeah. And then if we're not putting the right nutrients in our system, now you can see why why we're we're sick. Right. You know, you guys are young. You're able to fight a lot of this stuff off. You know, your body it, it takes a while before that abuse kind of shows up. Mm -hmm. But when you're older, you can't fight that off so well. Right. You know, so when you guys are like now doing things properly, uh, you know, uh, staying away, in my opinion, from chlorine and fluoride, <laughs> and eating right, you know, you can produce a healthy body and have healthy life quality of life and longevity. Right. So besides seeking like professional help, what are some simple things we can do just by ourselves to protect us against these things? I would say eat properly, number one. Yeah. All right. Um, cut down on sugars. Sugars mess up the, the liver, first of all. Uh, there, uh, there are, it's a great part of the, of the population walking around with some form of liver dysfunction. I don't want to call it disease. Um, but disease is actually a good word. It just means disease. You know, being out of the normal. Uh, our liver does a majority of work of filtering, filtering out every everything that we consume goes mm -hmm. right to our liver immediately, and those toxins need to be taken out. So if we're eating a high carbohydrate diet and we're building up this fatty liver, our liver can't do that. And then once the liver starts to dysfunction, then everything that we eat, and every chemical, every medicine, in fact, that we take has to be metabolized in that liver, that process begins to stop. Mm -hmm. And then we, don't, we can't have the benefits of, of um, the process of being well right. because of that. So I, I would say eating properly, staying hydrated is a big one. And uh, you need to have good quality water. Yeah. You know, I like personally having water that's, that's a pH of 9.5. Um, the reason is we're meant to be a little bit alkaline and everything that we do makes us a little bit acidic and we're always fighting this acidity problem in our bodies. 
We know, medically know, that where there's acidity, there's disease. And where there's alkalinity, there's less disease because mm -hmm. there's oxygen there. Right. So uh, I like alkaline water that's been purified and doing what it's doing to help our bodies become alkaline. Right. The interesting thing, it doesn't do anything directly. What it does is it causes our stomach to be diluted in stomach acid. And then um, as a result of that, the stomach wants to go back to being acidic because we need acid in our stomach. Mm -hmm. And then our small intestines and our pancreas make sodium bicarbonate, which makes our blood alkaline. So that's how it works, you know. Yeah. But, um, you know, we're, we're just about at the end of the show. Uh, do you have any, any final question that you guys wanted to ask? Um, well, how can we help with our pets with that problem? Actually, uh, quality food. You know, your, your dogs and your cats shouldn't be eating green. They can't eat green. They're not meant to eat green. Right. And you need a good quality, I like single source raw food. And that's one of the best things you could do. And that will help even their thyroids because it'll be the production of glutathione plus the nutrients that they need to, they need to eat. Nice. You know? Yeah, I want to thank you both for, for conducting the show today. Thank it you. Was, it was yeah. My <laughs> pleasure. Mor Morgan and Matthews <laughs> and Tori Billings. Thank you so much. Remember, a healthy pet is a happy pet. When you're healthy, you're happy as well. And you can listen to me live every Saturday morning at 9 o'clock at AM 1250 on my show, Healthy Pets, Healthy People. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you both. Thank you.